Hello everybody, welcome back to another episode of Decoding the Unknown. This one, a Vatican conspiracy. Was Pope John Paul the first poisoned? Is he the recent one? Or was he John Paul the second? I think that was John Paul the second, right? The guy, was he in the 90s? That Pope? I don't know. No, I have no idea. Uh, if someone asked me who's the Pope now, I'd be like, isn't it that Brazilian dude? Is he Brazilian or is he Polish? <laughs> Was John Paul II Polish? I didn't remember. Look, well, I don't keep up with popes. I'm not a Catholic. But I guess we're going to find out if one of these dudes was poisoned. And they burn the black. And then the, the, the smoke and stuff, right? Look, I know most about popes from Dan Brown movies. So let's, let's crack on, shall we? Pronunciation note about the name of today's protagonist. Please resist the ungodly temptation to pronounce his name as Albino. <laughs> Yeah, as an English speaker would. In Italian, his name sounds more like Albino. You may pronounce all other names as you see fit. <laughs> Honestly, Arnardo, I'll pronounce all the names as I see fit. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, okay, look, I'll do my best. <laughs> but as somebody, it, his name is spelt Albino. So even though, I don't, is he an albino? Maybe he is an albino, but that's how I'm going to imagine him throughout this entire episode. Albino Luciani was found dead in his bed in the early hours of September the 29th, 1978, after yet another night of restless sleep following a hard day at work. The official cause of death was established to be myocardial infarction, better known as a heart attack. In normal circumstances, that sentence should have been followed by a hard full stop, but in the case of Mr. Luciani, I'm afraid we'll have to replace that full stop with a hefty dose of however followed by a good serving of allegedly why do popes have different names this dude's name is albino luciani and he's like yeah yeah no just call me john <laughs> like what's that about yeah yeah no uh my name's simon uh but you can call me peter like <laughs> okay <laughs> you see albino luciani had a very peculiar job he was the pope of the Roman Catholic Church. He had been elected by the Conclave of Cardinals only 33 days prior, choosing to be called John Paul. Why? Yo, ChatGPT, what's up, my brother? I want to know, like, why do popes choose different names? Make the answer really short, because I don't want to bore the poor people at home, and I know you have a tendency to ramble on. So let's keep it tight. Maybe, like, one sentence. Why do popes have different names than their actual names? Hey, popes choose different names to honor past saints or popes and to symbolize a new spiritual identity as they begin their papacy. <laughs> Thank you. That was really short. I'm sorry I was rude. No worries at all. Uh, I'm here to help, and I'm glad you found the answer useful. Um, if you have any more questions, feel free to ask. God damn, it's terrifying, isn't it? Holy <laughs> Holy is your Hello everyone, just wanted to take a moment to tell you about a fantastic gift idea for your loved ones, or indeed yourself, if you're feeling a bit like, I deserve it, don't I just? Well look, avoid giving your loved ones or yourself a bad gift this year, and get them something special from today's sponsor, Ridge. Look, if you don't know Ridge, they've been redefining everyday essentials with style and practicality, and this time, they're turning up the heat with their new Hyperlime and Ceramic Powder Collection. These are beautiful, ultra-bright, really impressive things. The new Hyperline collection is a burst of colour inspired by high-performance gear, perfect for those who crave both style and utility. And that's not all. The Ceramic Powder Collection offers pastel shades with a smooth, soft finish. Scratch-resistant. Listen to this. It sounds nice, doesn't it? With more than 30 colours and styles, including classic leather options, which I have here, by the way. It's like a mix between a Ridge wallet and a classic wallet, like the nice of leather on there but the practicality of ridge plus here's the kicker they offer air tag attachments and all relevant products so you'll never lose your essentials again ridge wallet expands to hold up to 12 cards this is my wallet that i use every day here the burnt titanium look i've just got three cards in there two bank cards and my id say goodbye to your bulky old wallet and these are designed with rfid blocking so you don't have to worry about digital pickpockets either which is nice plus there's the ridge key case got that here which holds up to six keys i think i have four in there these are my office keys on there easy look it doesn't even jingle just a tiny little bit listen that's it no more jangling around plus in hyperlime as well and look when you buy these two things together 
the key case and the wallet, you can get 30% off. Plus, they offer a 99-day risk-free trial, so you can get the perfect present worry-free. And here's a great deal for you. Go to ridge.com slash unknown and get up to 30% off through December the 20th. And by using my link, ridge.com slash unknown, you can enter your email for a free chance to win a Ridge bundle worth $4,000. No purchase needed. Thanks to Rich for sponsoring, and now back to it. However, it already started to leave his distinctive mark on the Holy See, hinting at institutional reforms which were bound to leave many a powerful prelate deeply unhappy. What the f is a prelate? I don't care enough to ask ChatGPT, but I will click on the word and click look up. Prelate, a high-ranking member of the Christian clergy. I could have guessed that, couldn't I? Or is it prelate? Moreover, no autopsy was performed after his death, and Vatican authorities had bungled official communications about his demise, releasing statements which proved to be complete and unjustified lies. If that wasn't enough, revelations about the Pope's long list of enemies started swirling in the dimly lit corridors of the Vatican palaces, spilling unchecked onto the pages of newspapers and allegedly non-fiction books. Crooked financial institutions, the Mafia, secret Masonic lodges, among others, all appeared to have a strong motive to get rid of that smiling, caring, unassuming, yet tenacious Pope. Okay, honestly. <laughs> Arnaldo, I don't want to be mean, but I started this episode being like, oh god, religion, popes, Blech. and now I'm in, man, like mafia pope. Yes. So the questions lingered on for decades about the ultimate fate of Pope John Paul II, also known as Pope Luciano or the Smiling Pope. He's smiling because he's got in with the mafia. The mafia's being like, "Yo, Popey, what can we hook you up with?" You just gotta like, why would the mafia want him with the pope? What advantages does the pope have that the mafia could use? I don't know. <laughs> I know nothing about popes. <laughs> Had he died of natural causes, or had he been poisoned? Was there an intricate, murderous conspiracy slithering inside the Vatican, fueled by shady financial interests and organized crime? All kneel now, and let's decode. <laughs> I remember, I, I've mentioned this many times, but sometimes just memories from my past come to, my, to the fore. And it's, I've said this many times, I went to a religious school. It wasn't a Catholic school, so I don't know the specifics of Catholicism. That's the word. But I do remember, like, we'd have prayers, right? And you could either choose to kneel, or you could just lean over. And no one ever would kneel. But for whatever reason, the church, the chapel as we called it, it was a big chapel though, you could see like hundreds of people, was filled like every row had these pillows like that you could kneel down on. And all those pillows were ever used for was throwing at each other before the teachers arrived in chapel. <laughs> That's the only purpose those pillows served. A confession. My dearest and most reverend Father Simon, forgive me for I have sinned not once but twice. Oh, don't worry, Arnaldo. It just makes you more interesting. My first sin is that I pitched this topic for mere personal, for mere personal reasons. You see, Albino, got it right, yes, Luciano died about two months after my conception, which I gather was not immaculate. <laughs> okay, <laughs> thanks for those details, Arnaldo. I don't think I've ever calculated my, ins uh, my conception because I don't like to think about my conception. In his 33 days as pontiff, the smiling Pope had left a profound and positive impression on many Catholics worldwide who perceived his warmly intelligent demeanor as a promise for a more open and simpler approach to the Christian faith. My parents were among those who looked at him in hope and thus decided to honor his memory through their yet unborn child. Wait, how? That's why my middle name is Albino. <laughs> Arnaldo Albino. <laughs> Teodor, Teo, Teodorani? Oh, oh, now do I realize I don't know how to pronounce your surname. Let me have a crack at that. Teodorani? Teodorani! <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm just being offensive. Oh, I'm sorry. Let's just carry on, shall we? We're really not making much progress today. We've got a whole episode to get through. Oh my god. And that's why I've always been fascinated by his person. Pitching this topic was a way for me to dig deep into his story and clear the mists around his untimely death. My second sin is that for all my adult life, I've been a staunch proponent of the conspiracy theory. Yes, I admit it. To me, it made absolute sense that a pope cannot die naturally after only 33 days on Peter's throne. Well, isn't the thing about popes? Aren't they all, like, old as f Like, you're a pope because they're like, oh, you're old and wise and you've... I don't know, touched the requisite number of children. <laughs> now you may become Pope! God, that's just offended so many people, hasn't it? Yep.
That's okay, though. That's okay. It's what the Catholic Church is up to. And when we get into the dealings of those who surrounded Albino Luciani, you may understand why one may entertain that notion. At the time of writing these lines, I'm yet to dive deep into the research material I've collected, so let's see where this is going. For the moment, however, I consider myself to be part of Team Poisoning. Therefore, I'm happy to acknowledge my most grievous guilt. I'll wait for thy absolution, and will eagerly kneel in a corner to recite my Our Fathers and Hail Marys. I've got a friend of mine who's Spanish. And so he's like vaguely Catholic. And he was telling me like one of those, there's like some unforgivable sins that you can do that mean it's like, because like Catholicism, right? It's like you do some bad, are like you out there, you murder some, you like do a genocide or whatever. And you're like, forgive me, Father, for I have sinned. And the father's like, yo, 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 Hail Marys, uh, genocide, you say, well, you're going to need to do hundreds of those. And then you do. And then it's like, good, good. Off to heaven we go. But apparently there's some like unforgivable sins and one of those unforgivable sins is murdering the Pope. I think there's only like three or something, right? Right, ChatGPT, right? Yo, 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 ChatGPT. So a mate of mine is Spanish and he's like Catholic and he was telling me that in Catholicism there are some unforgivable sins which mean like no matter what, the church or the dude in the box isn't going to come back and he's going to be like, yo, 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 it's all cool. You can go to heaven. And he said like one of those was killing the Pope. Like if you murder the Pope, that's it. Game over. There were a couple of others, if I remember right. And again, don't write a really long answer. Just like write a list of like the other sins that if they exist, that you can't go to heaven for. Okay, crack on. Uh, actually, in Catholicism, there's a concept of sins against the Holy Spirit, which are considered unforgivable. These include despair, presumption, envy of another's spiritual good, obstinacy in sin, final impenitence, and deliberate resistance to the known truth. The idea is not that these sins can't be forgiven, but rather that they involve a state of heart that resists God's mercy. The specific act of killing a pope isn't listed as an unforgivable sin in Catholic teachings. Remember, forgiveness in Catholicism is always available if a person truly repents and seeks it. Okay, I'm sorry, I was wrong, and I had to cut you off because I'm getting a phone call. I'll be right back. Bye. <laughs> the Smiling Bishop. Before we analyze the death of the Pope, it's only fair that we address his life. Albino Luciano was born in Belluno, northern Italy, on October the 17th, 1912. The son of a devout Catholic mother and a socialist anti-clerical father, he grew up to admire both the church and Christ's commitment to helping the poor. In 1935, Albino was ordained as a priest and slowly but surely started to rise through the ranks of the clergy. In December of 1958, he was appointed bishop by Pope John XXIII, and in December 1969, Pope Paul VI appointed him patron Patriarch or Archbishop of Venice. This was quite the appointment as Patriarch of Venice, Luciano oversaw the spiritual needs of the inhabitants of a vast region in northeastern Italy, as well as the day to day administrative duties of the clergy reporting to him. That's a clerical double whammy for you. Luciano soon consolidated his reputation as a man of simple, humble tastes and demeanor. Yet the perennial smile which lighted his features concealed a steely determination. The patriarch was a workhorse, a steamroller, who toiled away at his duties up to 15 hours a day, answering every letter and listening to everybody who wanted to speak to him. Failure was a rare occurrence for this smiling bishop, but he did fail. And it was on those occasions that he first clashed his will and his wits with a trio of characters, uh, which will take center stage when we get to the conspiracy theories. Whenever these three gentlemen are mentioned by English-speaking reporters, the adjective shady is consistently used. They were shady businessmen who performed shady financial deals. Accordingly, I'll keep them partially in the shade for now. Allow me to introduce them quickly. I shall provide some more details later on. The first character was a fellow archbishop, American Paul Maxinkus, head of the Institute for Religious Works. Known by the Italian acronym IOR, this institute is often referred to as the Vatican Bank. This is a misnomer as it gives the impression that the IOR is THE National Bank of the Vatican. The IOR is just A Vatican Bank, mostly concerned with financial investments. Wait, there's more than one bank in the- don't like six people live in the Vatican? And like one of them's the Pope? How many banks do you need? But from now on, I will use the terms IOR and the Vatican Bank for the sake of simplicity. 
Marcinkus was closely associated with one Roberto Calvi, director general of another bank, Banco Ambrosano, and those two were close friends with yet another banker and investor, Mikel Sindona, himself allegedly involved in money laundering on behalf of the mafia. But back to Luciano now. One of the institutions he could rely on in his duties was the Catholic Bank of Venetia, a small bank which loaned money on very favorable terms to parishes and dioceses. At the time, the IOR owns 37% of the shares in the Catholic Bank, i.e. a relative majority. In 1972, Marcinkus decided to sell the stock to Calvi's Banco Ambrosiano, an operation that was facilitated through Michelle Sindona's intermediation. <laughs> I'm like, okay, banks are selling to other banks and there's stuff going on. Banky, banky, bank! Marcinus Vatican Bank pocketed $45 million in the sale, a much-needed injection of cash for the institution. The Catholic Bank of Venetia was now controlled by a private institution which had little interest in financing the charitable works of local churches at advantageous conditions. Okay, so there's a bank that was basically controlled by the Catholic Church and it's been bought out by another bank that is privately controlled. I am following the banky bank stuff. It's like trying to follow an episode of Billions. <laughs> what's going on? And what's with all the random cultural references that I don't get? Obviously, Patriarch Luciani could not tolerate such callous application of unbridled capitalism. Had he known about it, he would have certainly opposed the sale, but that was the problem. Despite him being the most senior clergyman in the Venetia region, Marcinkus had acted behind Luciani's back. In late 1972, Luciani had another banking-related disappointment. This time, it was the collapse of the Bank of San Marco in Venice itself, another small financial institution inspired by Catholic ideals. Also, in this case, Albino Luciani may have had a grudge against Marcinkus. The IOR could have saved the San Marco from bankruptcy, but he didn't lift a finger. So, in February 1973, Luciani visited Rome to meet with Pope Paul VI and with Giulio Andriotto, a senior Christian Democrat politician. During both encounters, Luciani complained about the unscrupulous conduct of Marcinkus and his Vatican Bank, advocating for a restructuring of such an institution. Why had Marcinkus associated himself with businessmen already rumored to be money launderers for organized crime? Why had he so prominently sacrificed the good old Catholic Bank of Venetia? Why had he not reinvested the cash to save the Bank of San Marco? Luciano's short stay in Rome made an impression on Father Ettore Malnati, who later stated that Luciani had a personal meeting also with Paul Marcinkus. It sounds like very, very allegedly that old Paul Marcinkus here is a little bit more interested in his own pockets than he is with the religious -y stuff. The two archbishops clashed in the latter's office, but the American clergyman refused to yield to Luciani's continued demands to save the San Marco. Again, according to Malnati, Luciani confided to a friend that Marcinkus had unceremoniously shown him the door. He said, I have been treated by Marcinkus like a school janitor. It seems as though a rivalry had been born that day. Wait, isn't this one dude like a clergyman or whatever? And this other, and yeah, he seems a bit powerful, like in his banking dealings behind the back. But the other dude's archbishop that's that's important that's like a turbo bishop in one corner the pragmatist and ruthless businessman clad in religious garb who was once quoted as saying you cannot run a church on hail mary's alone in the other the idealist hard-working prelate with a reformer's heart who had criticized religious financial institutions a rivalry had been born one which according to certain authors may have sparked a murderous act some five years later but had it though to continue my earlier confession, up to now I always had considered the 1973 Marcinius Luciani bout to be gospel, but it took a little amount of research to realize that this story features only in the memories of Father Malnati, and it was picked up by other authors. This is so often the case, like when you dig a little bit deeper, it's like, oh yeah, this this happened. And it's like, well, no, according to this guy, years later that happens, and he could have his own agenda. It's like, I don't know. <laughs> So little of what you read is that perfectly correct. And Father Malnati may have been influenced by rumors circulating after the death of Pope Luciani. While I would not discount 100% Malnati's account, let's at least consider other differing versions. First of all, while there are official records of Luciani's other important Roman meetings in February 1973, there are no written records about his encounter with Marcinkus. The American Archbishop himself admitted to refusing to save the Bank of San Marco, despite having the power and opportunity to do so. In an interview released to journalist John Cornwell, Marcinkus declared 
declared that he did not know the San Marco was so important to the church in Venice, but in any case he would never have acquired it because it was a bad investment. Yeah, it's like, please, save my bank, we're doing so much good work, and the other guy's like, bro, I'm a businessman. Yeah, I might be like wearing this like religious collar thing, but bro, bro, P&Ls, baby. <laughs> He realized that such a move may have angered the patriarch of Venice, Albino Luciani, but the two had neither met nor otherwise discussed the matter. The Smiling Pope Let us now skip to the next big event in Albino Luciani's life. Following the death of Pope Paul VI, Luciani, who had become a cardinal in March 1973, was invited to join the conclave, the assembly in charge of electing the next pope. And he was like, it shall be me. Yo, ChatGPT, what's the youngest pope? Like, who's... who's... Who is the youngest pope to ever be made pope? The youngest pope in history is generally believed to be Pope Benedict IX. He became pope around the age of 20, but his exact age at the time of his papacy is not precisely known. Benedict IX, sir. Shh, 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 shh. That's enough. 20. You always thought the popes were like old as f Maybe that young pope TV show is onto something. Sorry, I was just curious about that. It took the conclave only two days to agree that the new pontiff should be Cardinal Luciani. On August the 26th, 1978, he became Pope John Paul I. Oh, sh**. I was just joking. I assumed that he'd join this conclave, then he'd sit in there voting for other people to be the pope for f ages. And then, boom. He was there for like two days. And then they're like, yeah, dude, it's you. <laughs> Skip ahead one place. I can still remember my first month on the job, one which I will not mention, but suffice to say that it took me two weeks to understand how to use Outlook and Excel, another week for basic training, and a fourth week to sort out how the canteen payment system worked. I, people use Outlook and Excel? People still use this? Like, I just use Gmail, like, literally for, I don't know, forever. When did Gmail launch? That's when I started using Gmail. Actually, it probably wasn't, because I remember at first you had to be invited to use Gmail. And Excel? That's what Google Sheets is for. By contrast, my almost namesake, Pope, was a paragon of productivity, churning out reform projects so early and so quickly that he was bound to ruffle a few feathers. Two days after his election, he clearly signaled that a new Catholic church under his direction should not concern itself with material concerns nor temporal power. John Paul I did so by cancelling the traditional lavish and pompous coronation ceremony, which was replaced by a simple inaugural mass. If the message was not clear enough, the new pope spelled it out in a speech to foreign diplomats. The Catholic Church, the Holy See, the Vatican would not concern themselves with political and economic matters, but simply with a spiritual agenda and the, quote, humane causes that the temporal power is intended to advance. At another point in his speech, he announced that we have no public goods to exchange. Some days later, on September the 10th, he delivered another landmark speech, this time in front of a packed St. Peter's Square. The Vatican elite was shocked to hear the Pope uttering some almost blasphemous concepts. God is our father. Even more, he is our mother. What was this gender-bending heresy? How dare this plucky newcomer upset so radically the word of the Lord? Uh, guess what, guys? He's the Pope, and you chose him. <laughs> Whoops! If you don't like it, whose fault is that exactly? It turns out that Pope Luciani had been quoting directly from the Gospel of the Lord, more precisely from the Old Testament, even more precisely from the prophet Isaiah. Surely the people in the, the audience would know that. They'd be like, oh yeah, oh yeah, that was Isaiah. Yeah, sure, Isaiah, that dude. Yeah. It's up to people really know the Bible. Like, you see it in movies, right? Where someone will say something, you know, they'll be talking, and then in church, or like the, the clergyman's there or whatever, and it'll be some obscure reference, like, oh yeah, I lost my wallet and you know the priest will be like well as you know peter chapter 4 verse 16 what goes away from man cometh back in other forms and you're like how, how, how? do you bet did you memorize the whole bible like what the f did you just make this up like i just did <laughs> how you do this stuff Paradoxically, the same establishment who had elected Luciani as Pope appeared to be constantly on edge about what he might say or do in his first days on the job, and yet his criticism of the Vatican's business interests and unorthodox views on Catholic doctrine were well known. Just to give you an example, back in 1968, when he was still Bishop Luciani, our protagonist had penned a confidential report addressed to his superior, arguing that the church should allow Catholics to use the contraceptive pill, a radical departure from the Vatican's position on the matter. Yeah, I mean, I'm sorry, but the Catholic Church is just wrong on this one. Obviously, contraception would be useful. Isn't like... Okay, let's ask ChatGPT again. Why is it so hard to click on that little button that does the voice? Yo, ChatGPT, I always heard 
that one of the reasons the like AIDS pandemic in Africa was so bad was because the Catholic Church, you know, they, they made everyone Catholics and then they were like, no condoms, none at all. And that's the reason why there's like lots of AIDS and stuff in Africa. Is that is that true? Have I got that right? Or is that just some like one of those rumors that floats around? You're touching on a complex issue. The spread of HIV AIDS in Africa has been influenced by a variety of factors, not just one single cause. Um, it's true that the Catholic Church has historically opposed the use of condoms, advocating for abstinence and fidelity instead. This stance, particularly in heavily Catholic regions, might have influenced attitudes towards condom use. However, attributing the AIDS pandemic in Africa solely to the Catholic Church's stance I wasn't doing on that. condoms oversimplifies the situation. There are other significant factors contributing to the spread of HIV. I wasn't saying it was exclusively that. I'm just saying that like was a factor and you agree with me. Okay, we're in agreement. Maybe we shouldn't have done that. And I mean, we, not me as like a Catholic. I'm not a Catholic, like we as humanity. Seems like a really bad idea. After his death, there was some speculation that he intended to make his own stance, the official one. But the truth is the Pope, Luz Pope Luciani, Pope Luciani, Pope Luciani, never spoke in public about his positive views on birth control. The conservative faction, which was likely to oppose a new Pope, was particularly strong amongst Roman Curia, the administrative central body of the church. And the Curia itself was torn by internal rivalries and bickering, which absorbed much of John Paul's time and energy. The Pope was 66 years old by this time, still maintained his 15-hour-a-day regime, and probably the accounts where he kept his was heavily overdrawn when it came to handling this type Mum, if you're watching or listening, I apologize for using this language in the same paragraph that mentions the Pope, but I'm sure Albino would agree. Apparently, he confided to a friend, I have noticed two things that appear to be in very short supply in the Vatican. Honesty and a good cup of coffee. A dead shall come like a thief in the night on the last day of his life september the 28th 1978 pope john paul conducted his daily grind hard at work reading and writing tons of documents especially reading he once joked that he did not need a typewriter but a type reader so that he could process the reams of incoming letter letters and memos faster well that you've got a type reader it's called your eyes those who were close to him like his personal secretaries noted how john paul appeared constantly overworked overstressed and fatigued by the sheer volume of work load in the weeks after the conclave. At 6.30 p.m., the Pope held the last meeting of the day with Vatican Secretary of State Cardinal Jean Villot. After the meeting, Jean Paul dined with his personal secretaries, Father Diego Lorenzi and Father John McGee. During dinner, the Pope experienced pain and a sense of oppression on his chest for about five minutes, at one point clutching the area with his hands. Bro, that's when you call an ambulance. There's an old dude clut- Like, literally, this is what it looks like in movies when someone has a heart attack. Ah! Oh, ah, and then like call an ambulance. Like what the hell? <laughs> Father McGee suggested they call the doctor on call at the Vatican, but John Paul refused any help. The pain was easing. Besides, he had experienced it on a number of occasions before, and he attributed it to mild rheumatic pain. Um, how about you don't attribute it to rheumatic pain, but you go to the hospital and see what's up with you? <laughs> You're the Pope. After dinner, the Pope placed two phone calls, one at 9pm with the Archbishop of Milan and one at 9.30 with his personal doctor back in Venice. There we go. Pope Luciano then retired to his bedroom. Father Lorenzi, worried about the Pope's health, health, helped him to his bed. He then pointed to the emergency button next to the bedstead and advised him to push it should he need help. As the personal secretary left the room, John Paul was sitting upright on his bed holding some typewritten pages, the last memos of the day. The next morning, September the 29th at 7.30, Italian public radio and news agency ANSA broadcast the most unexpected news. Only 33 days after his election, Albino Luciani, Pope John Paul II, had been found dead in the morning in his bedroom. The newswire mentioned the official cause and time of death, acute myocardial infarction, which had happened at 11 p.m. It also included a description of how his body had been found. Quote, This morning around 5.50, the Pope's secretary did not see the Holy Father praying in his chapel, as was his custom. The secretary entered his bedroom and found him dead in an upright reading position. The ensuing news reports identified the secretary found the Pope's lifeless body as either Father Lorenzi or Father McGee. The truth is that neither secretary found him. For some reason, the Vatican press room decided to hide from answer, the Italian press agency, that John Paul had been found first by two nuns. Sister Vincenza Taffarel had been an insistent to Pope Luciani since he was the Bishop of Venice. Every morning at 5.15am, Sister Vincenza prepared a cup of espresso and left it on a table just outside the papal bedroom. She would then return shortly afterwards to collect the empty cup. That morning, the nun noticed that the cup was still full. Sister Vincenza addressed another nun working with her, Sister Margarita Marin. 
He hasn't walked out yet. How come? Sister Margarita witnessed Sister Vincenza knocking on the door of the papal bedroom. When no response came, she walked in. Sister Margarita heard the other nun saying, Your Holiness, you shouldn't be playing these pranks on me. Sister Vincenza then called for Margarita. The second nun entered the room and noticed how the Pope appeared to be sleeping with a faint smile on his face, hands still clutching his memos. Sister Margarita touched his hands and felt they were cold. The fingernails had started to darken. The two sisters went to fetch the Pope's personal secretaries. Father McGee was the first to appear on the scene. McGee then alerted Secretary of State Cardinal Villot, who in turn summoned the doctor on duty, Renato Buzzanetti. Buzzanetti's a great name. Buzzanetti. As the secretaries, the cardinal and the doctor filed into the bedroom, the two sisters walked out. Some minutes later, McGee joined them and informed them of the doctor's diagnosis. The Pope had succumbed to mark cardiac infarction at 11 p.m. The death was sudden, and John Paul had likely suffered no pain. Sister Margarita later reported that Father McGee had asked the two nuns, not to mention it was them who had first discovered the body of the paintiff, quote, because they had decided to report that it had been the personal secretaries who first found him. Okay. <laughs> Why? <laughs> That's not a, that's not a reason. The reasons for this decision are not clear. It has been speculated that Vatican officials simply found it inconvenient that the Pope had been found by two women. Whatever the motive, this clumsy handling of the event generated initial confusion on the circumstances of Luciani's death, fueling suspicion and conspiracy theories. In the early hours of September the 29th, Vatican officials took another more controversial decision, which was also poorly handled and communicated. They decided that the body should not be subject to an autopsy, and arranged for the Vatican's funeral directors to immediately embalm the deceased Pope. Behindologists. Immediately after Pope Luciani's death, rumors began to swirl around the corridors of the Vatican and in newsrooms across Italy, fueled by the poor handling of the early newswires and the decision not to perform a post mortem on the body. It did not help that, according to some early bungled statements, the Vatican's funeral directors of choice had been summoned one hour before the body was discovered. So, for the moment, let's put ourselves in the shoes of an ordinary Joe, trying to make sense of the news in Rome in the late 1970s. The entire country was, and partially still is, steeped in a mindset which Italians refer to as behindology. The conviction that someone, somewhere, is always conspiring behind the scenes, and there were some good reasons to look for dark conspiratorial cabals lurking around every corner. Let me give you just a couple of examples. In 1964, General De Lorenzo of the military police had plotted a coup d'etat, a conspiracy known as the Solo Plan. The coup was eventually halted in its inception and revealed only years later. It emerged that General De Lorenzo enjoyed the support of high-ranking politicians as well as one archbishop. Ooh, spicy. I didn't even know there was a, supposed to be a coup in the Vatican. That's crazy. In December 1970, a second coup was attempted, this time by a former fascist naval officer, Junio Valerio Borghese. Armed insurgents were ready to take over key public institutions when the coup was silently aborted. Again, the plan only came to light in March of 1971, and in later years, a broad conspiracy fresco was unveiled. Borghese had found allies among far-right terrorists, members of the Secret Service, and even tacit support from the U.S. Embassy in Rome, as attested by CIA declassified files. Investigative journalists had already started writing about the alleged unholy alliances between the Mafia, terrorism, secret Masonic lodges, certain political parties, and deviated members of the armed forces and secret services. And I'll stop there, but if our listeners and viewers have the time and patience, I would invite them to look into that terrifyingly complex rabbit hole by searching for Italy, Years of Lead, and Italy, Strategy of Tension. The point I'm trying to make is that complex plots did take place in my fair homeland, some of which have been proven to be true others are still alleged, so a conspiracy theory behind the sudden death of a pope would be the natural go-to explanation in the world capital of behindology. Suspect number one, the French Cardinal. The lead conspiracist in this case, however, is not an Italian author, but a British one, David Yallop, who laid out his theories in his 1984 bestseller in God's Name. Yallop speculated that Albino Luciani, Pope John Paul I, had been murdered with a lethal overdose of a cardiology drug, Digitalis, also known as Digoxin. The author confidently claims that a fatal dose of Digitalis, half a teaspoonful, teaspoonful would be undetectable. If it was added to the other medicines which the Pope took regularly, a treatment called Efortil indica indicated for low blood pressure. Yallop did not single out one single culprit, but several suspects, all of which had something to gain from the Pope's death. 
These alleged poisoners may have acted independently or may have conspired together to eliminate their powerful enemy from the Vatican. So let's start with Cardinal Jean Villot, the Secretary of State. Villot may have had the occasion to administer the lethal dose of digoxin as he had met with the Pope on the afternoon of his death at 6.30 p.m. According to several testimonies, Villot was one of the first to rush to the Pope's bedside on the following morning. He may have had the occasion to remove any incriminating evidence. And what about the motive? Cardinal Villot had been in the post since the previous pontificate, serving under Pope Paul VI. The recently elected Pope Luciano had inherited Villot from his predecessor and disliked, disliked Villot's policies. Sensing his dismissal, the Cardinal had therefore decided to eliminate his new boss. That seems a bit extreme. It's like, I don't like his policies very much. It's like, it's, it doesn't seem like a reason to murder your boss, especially when you're like super religious and your boss is literally the Pope. The claim was debunked by Paul Hoffman at the New York Times as early as the book was published. It appears the Pope John Paul I actually valued the overall performance and advice of Cards and Orvelo, and one of his first acts as pontiff had been to confirm Villot's appointment as Secretary of State. There is a second possible motive. According to several Italian journalists such as Eric Frattini and Federico Bertuzzi, some days before his death, Pope Luciano received a copy of Political Observer, a magazine edited and directed by investigative journalist Mino P Pecarelli. This Pecarelli had an uncanny ability to recruit confidential sources within the secret services, which allowed him to expose political and criminal scandals ahead of his peers. In the mid-1970s, Pecarelli had either willingly joined or infiltrated a secret Masonic lodge, Propaganda 2 or P2 for short, which in the early 1980s would be exposed as a massive conspiracy aimed at installing an authoritarian regime in Italy. This experience made Pecarelli something of an expert on secret Masonic lodges, and his September 1978 issue of Political Observer featured an expose about a secret lodge replete with senior clergymen. This was quite the scandal, as the Catholic Church did not see eye to eye with Freemasons, striking them with excommunication, i.e. exclusion from participation in the sacraments and religious services. In other words, one could not be a member of the clergy and a Freemason at the same time. Pecorelli's magazine published a list which included several high-ranking players within the Curia, including Cardinal Villot. So the speculation here is that the Pope may have been enraged by the expose and may have considered purging the Vatican of the Masonic Lodge, but he was stopped before he could take action. Now. There are several problems with this theory, in itself rather flimsy. In his original, yeah, this feels like it's just some pretty wild speculation. In his original article, Paccarelli seem, himself seems to take the list with a pinch of salt, not citing the source and warning that it may be a fabrication. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Even he thinks it's not real. Furthermore, there is no direct evidence that Pope Luciani actually received the issue of Political Observer with the list, nor that he decided to act upon it. In fact, there are differing versions on how the Pope got hold of the documents listing the Vatican Masons. According to Pecorelli's sister, it was the journalist himself who handed the list into the hands of the Pope the very day of his death. This is unlikely, as we know exactly how Luciano spent his last hours of life, and there are no records of Pecorelli visiting the Vatican. So I would exclude the Masonic conspiracy from the realm of possibility and proceed to the next big hitter in Yallop's roster of culprits, a character we already introduced, none other than American Archbishop Paul C. Marcinkus, head of the IOR or Vatican Bank. Yeah, I'm totally willing to dismiss this Masonic theory. It's just like guesswork and a dude who sold a book. Suspect number two, the American Bishop According to Yallop, Luciani was concerned about the IOR's shady financial deals championed by the pragmatic and morally ambiguous Marcinkus. The American Archbishop had in fact conducted business with questionable partners such as bankers Roberto Calvi and Michelle Sindona. Now, let me give you some details about these financial deals. Please note that this matter is incredibly complicated, so I'll only scratch the surface, honestly, probably for the best son out because otherwise I'll be like, I'm lost. <laughs> If anything gets incredibly complicated, I'm like, I'm out! I don't understand incredibly complicated things. What? I can I, I do, I do not understand. In the late 1950s throughout the 1960s, the IOR, or Vatican Bank, was booming. According to author Eric Frattini, in those years, the IOR controlled up to 5% of the Italian stock market. Thanks to a law promulgated by Mussolini in 1942 and never abrogated, Oh my god, these, I didn't even know the word. The opposite of promulgated was abrogated. The Vatican was exempt from paying taxes on capital gains. But in 1968, the law was changed and suddenly the Vatican faced a tax bill of an estimated 1.2 billion euros in today's value. That's almost $1.3 billion. Back then, the Pope was Paul VI. Wait, I thought, isn't the Vatican like its own country? I thought it was the smallest country. Can't they decide on their own, like, taxes? like capital gains and stuff like that or are they just like yeah okay italy 
you're kind of really in charge. <laughs> Back then, the Pope was Paul VI, who decided to move all of the Vatican investments abroad to dodge that bill. The man in charge of this complex operation was Michel Sindona. In the late 1950s, the financier had forged personal and professional relationships with three very powerful individuals. Paul Marcinkus, Mafia boss Joe Adonis, and David Kennedy. No relation to the Kennedys. Future Secretary of the Treasury for the Nixon administration. In 1971, Marcinkus was appointed head of the IOR and his cooperation with Sindona intensified. Thus, the bank who enjoyed the protection of organized crime, the Nixon administration, and the church was able to freely move capital across tax havens and shell companies, laundering money on behalf of the Mafia and the Vatican. Holy <laughs> Vatican. <laughs> if you're doing something the same as the Mafia, it's probably not the best thing in the world, is it? In the same year, Sindona found another ally, fellow banker Roberto Calvi. This is the director of Banco Ambrosiano, the guy who had acquired Luciano's beloved Catholic bank. The trio, Marcinkus, Sindona, Calvi, were on a money-making, tax-evading role in until 1974. Nixon's resignation removed a powerful ally from the scene, Secretary David Kennedy. At the same time, both Italian and American authorities had begun investigating Sindona for his involvement in money laundering as well as drug trafficking. Yo! Again, Vatican, if you're in bed or doing things the way the Mafia are, or if you're in bed with someone who's a drug trafficker, maybe be like, is this the best guy to be running our finances? I know we owe the Italians like a billion dollars, but should we be doing this with the drug guy? <laughs> the answer's no. Thus far, the partnership between Sindona had been encouraged by the Vatican's office of the Secretary of State, but when he became an embarrassment, they were quick to dump him and appointed Roberto Calvi as their sole financial advisor. This didn't sit well with Sindona, yeah, no shit who shopped his old pal to the financial authorities. Italy's central bank ordered an inspection into Banco Ambrosiano, uncovering a can of worms of enormous debt, fraud, tax evasion, and political corruption. Uh-oh! This constituted another huge embarrassment for the Vatican Bank and its head, Marcinkus. Luckily, the banker bishop could still count on the protection of Pope John Paul VI, but on August 6, 1978, the pontiff died and was replaced by John Paul I. In Yallop's reconstruction of events, Marcinkus and some mafia-friendly associates feared that the new pope might enact an overhaul of the Vatican Bank, an overhaul which would have kicked off with the dismissal of Marcinkus. Okay, Arnaldo said this would be complicated, and it does seem pretty complicated. So basically, the Vatican was like, they didn't want to pay the Italians, so they were like, we're gonna like be dodgy about this and do some like tax evading with a drug smuggler or a drug trafficker is that the same thing and basically it's all protected because the pope was like hey it's all good and nixon was like hey it's all good and then nixon resigns and the pope leaves and so now these other dudes who were organizing this are like oh <laughs> Right? The plotters may have been joined by another American prelate, Cardinal John Patrick Cody, later under investigation for financial misconduct in the Archdiocese of Chicago. However, in his book, Yallop was unable to produce little more than rumors and conjecture when it came to this alleged conspiracy perpetrated by the IOR. This theory rests on two pillars. First, that Luciani and Marcinkus bore a grudging rivalry against each other since the events of 1973. Second, that Luciani had already announced either an investigation or a dramatic shakeup of the IOR. Well, that makes perfect sense. This Luciani dude came in and he's like, I don't like money. We're just going to run this place on prayers. And people are surprised or like, oh no, he's going to shake up the bank. Of course he's going to shake up the bank. He's like, just give them the money. I don't want to be involved with drug smugglers because he's the f***ing Pope. As we have learned earlier, the rivalry between the two men may have been exaggerated, if not entirely made up. And while Pope John Paul I realistically disapproved of the IOR's banking practices, there is no certainty that he had already laid out plans to dismantle it, nor that he had publicly announced them. There is another fallacy, not strictly related to the Marcinkus theory, which pertains to the method of the alleged murder. Yallop speculated that Luciani had been poisoned with a lethal overdose of digitalis, or digoxin, which is claimed to have amounted to half a spoon. Now, if I can add my two own two cents here, I did some research on the effects of the overdose of this drug. According to the journal Australian Prescriber, sounds like a thrilling read, the drug can in fact cause fatal cardiac arrhythmias if administered in large doses. Death can sometimes occur asymptomatically, but it is more commonly associated with other adverse events such as anorexia, nausea, vomiting, and neurological symptoms. On the night of his death, 
Luciani did not display any of these side effects. Moreover, according to the Heart.org and Medscape, a single dose of digoxin has to exceed 10 mg in order to be fatal. The most common formulation of the digoxin oral solution has a concentration of 0.05 mg per milliliter. Oh my god, that's going to be a lot of this, whatever this juice is. In other words, to achieve an amount of 10 mg, one should administer a dose of, four to, of 200 mils of digoxin solution. That's the, like one of those mini cans of Coke that you get on an airplane. For context, 200 mils is equivalent to 40 teaspoons or 4,000 drops. Old Popey's gonna notice if he's being poisoned with this shit. Therefore, this is not some lethally potent and concentrated venom which some devious bishop could carry concealed in his ring like some pantomime villain. This would be... It would be pretty difficult to mix it surreptitiously into someone's drink or medicine. A similarly fatal concentration of digoxin into the human body could be achieved gradually over a long period of time, but it would almost appear inevitably carry the side effects that I described earlier, which again did not afflict the Pope in his last days of life. Marcinkus appears to be the chief culprit also in another much more recent book, When the Bullet Hits the Bone, published in October 2019. These are the memoirs of Anthony Luciano Raimondi a former Italo-American enforcer, enforcer with the Colombo Mafia Syndicate. Yeah, this is way more likely than the other one, which I've already forgotten about because it just didn't seem that likely. It seems very likely that this this seems to be... This is it, in my opinion, unless... I, I mean, maybe on Aldo in a minute we'll be like, except no, because it was all just rumor. Or maybe there's going to be a much more compelling one. But this seems to be the one. Ramondi is related to the legendary Mafia Don Lucky Luciano. More importantly for our case, his cousin happened to be Archbishop Marcinkus, who, by the way, died in February 2006. The enforcer revealed that when he was 28 years old, cousin Marcinkus summoned him to Rome to help eliminate the Pope. <laughs> hey, hey, come over here. Come over to Italy, to the Vatican, and we're gonna off the Pope. <laughs> You're like, okay, I'm on my way. Get me one of these little cans of Coke. According to his account, Paul John Paul I had uncovered a massive financial fraud within the Vatican, masterminded by the Bishop Banker. The fraudsters had been counterfeiting shares of large American companies such as IBM, Coca-Cola, and Sunoco to then sell at a huge profit. That is taking things to a different level. It's like, oh, no, no, no. Yeah, no, we're just doing fraud. <laughs> We're just making stuff and selling it. Aren't you the Catholic Church? Aren't you the same people who are like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you believe in God? Do you want to be forgiven? Give me 10% of your money. That's Catholic Catholicism, right? The tithing. They want like a percentage of the money. It's why like they're so rich. They are rich, right? So why do you need to do this? You've got loads of money. You can just run the place on prayers. I guess that this was possible back in the days when shares were actually printed as individual pieces of paper and kept safe inside security boxes. Pope Luciani had collected evidence on the scam and was about to report the counterfeiters, so naturally he had to go. Ramondi's job was to travel to Rome and then shadow the pontiff to study his movements and habits. On the night between September the 28th and 29th, Ramondi had infiltrated the Vatican palaces and was standing outside the papal bedroom. The murder, however, had been perpetrated by Barsinkas himself. The Archbishop had spiked the Pope's tea with Valium to knock him out. Later, he crept into his room and administered a lethal dose of cyanide with a dropper. On the morning after, when the dead body of Luciani was found, Marcinkus rushed into the bedroom acting surprised and dismayed. Raimondi's memoir was rejected by the Vatican as complete and utter rubbish. One may argue that they are not an impartial actor in this case, but I tend to agree with their one-star review. The first question that springs to mind is, why would Marcinkus seek help from a younger, fitter, more violent cousin with ties to the Mafia and then commit the murder himself? Logically, it would have made more sense to delegate the act to the Mafia Enforcer for the sake of plausible deniability. Wait, wait, wait. The Mafia Enforcer is the one writing the book, right? So you'd just be like, yeah, no, no, I did this. Maybe there's like a statue of limitations on like stalking the Pope. But I definitely didn't murder him. And it was actually this other dude. <laughs> All right. I just stepped back and was like, and now you do your thing. Ramondi states that his job was to shadow Luciani and take notes of his habits. But in those 33 days as Pope, he barely left the Vatican palaces and he adhered to a strict routine very well known to all those around him. If that was the extent of Ramondi's involvement, Marcinkus could have spared himself the airfare from New York to Rome. Finally, Ramondi states that Marcinkus was one of the first to rush to John Paul's bedside once his motionless body had been discovered. This contradicts several verified and published accounts which claim the contrary. The first to rush into the papal bedchamber were the two 
two nuns who assisted the Pope, followed by one of his personal secretaries, and then by the Secretary of State and a doctor on duty. My humble opinion is that Mr. My Raimondi has included this nice tale in his memoirs to drum up some press coverage. Well, Mr. Raimondi, it appears you've succeeded, seeing as we're covering it right here. Vatican allegedly, I mean, all of this is in Arnaldo's opinion, and shared by me, but it is just that, an opinion. Vatican conspiracies sell books after all, and I hope they also attract views and listens. Me too, Arnaldo. Again, in my opinion, the former mafia hitman cleverly painted himself as a secondary and rather inconsequential character in the scenario of Luciani's murder, casting blame instead on the long-dead Marcinkus. Well played, Raimondi. Please don't try and whack me. Yeah, I mean, that's what I see as most likely. But also, I can see the title for the next entry is No Suspects at All. And that's just what is probably most likely, right? He's an old man who was Pope for 33 days. It was really stressful, and he had a heart attack and died from being old and stressed. That just seems like, what's up? Yeah, he's just an old dead man. Why did they not do an autopsy? Because he's old. Why did they... Did, did they do something else to his body quickly afterwards or bury it or something because he's old and he's the pope he get he doesn't have to wait for like a funeral parlor to be ready he's the pope no suspects at all so far we have covered publications which espouse the murder theory so let's now look at two books which support the official cause of deaths originally communicated by the vatican the first one is like a thief in the night by john cornwell published in 1989 cornwell conducted an inquiry similar to the one pursued by yallop but he reached a completely different conclusion according to cornwell pope luciani died of natural causes but his death could have been prevented if the vatican administration had given him more support during the first weeks of his pontificate instead the new pope was left to his own devices stressed and overworked cornwell argued that john paul's already fragile cardiovascular health deteriorated progressively culminating with a heart attack the second book pope luciani chronicle of death was published in 2017 and written by the journalist stefania falasca who is part of the commission in charge of john paul's beautification a key stage in the process to eventual sainthood wait isn't beautification when you get made a saint I thought that was that. Falasca acknowledges that the Vatican took the perhaps too hasty decision to embalm. Ah, yes, they embalmed it. That was it. No autopsy, and then they embalmed him. Luciani's body without performing an autopsy, a decision which fueled conspiracy theories. She explains, however, that the same procedure had been applied to the previous Pope, Paul VI, to prevent the decomposition of the body in the heat of the Roman summer. Um, it's you've got fridges, right? Just pop them in the fridge or the freezer whatever they you know those trays that you get in like movies where the bodies are kept just pop in one of those as for the autopsy or lack thereof Alastair's book debunks the myth that it was the cardinals who decided not to perform it this decision was actually taken by the vatican doctor buzzanetti and two other cardiologists as they were quite certain about the cause of death and believed it was not necessary yeah they just go in there and be like oh look the pope's dead yeah he's old What's he dead from? Heart attack? Okay. What kills us of all people? Heart attack! Boom! Done! Velasco then went on to include the integral medical record compiled by Buzzanetti, who certified the death as caused by cardiovascular disease, ischemic heart disease due to coronary atherosclerosis. Buzzanetti's records also clarify how this type of ailment ran in the late Pope's family. And Luciani himself, back in 1975, had been hospital hospitalized due to a thromboembolism of the central artery of the left eye's retina. This cause of hospitalization was convertible with Luciani's atherosclerosis, which would later have a much more severe effect. And to me, that seals the deal. I'd approach this script with a preconceived notion that Pope John Paul I, Albino Luciani, may have been indeed murdered by an obscure cabal of Freemasons and or corrupt financiers. I'm just going to go ahead now and say, like, he died of natural causes. And second theory would be it's the corrupt financiers, and no, it's not the Masons. Clear ranking for me. 70% likelihood he's just an old man who had a heart attack. 25% likelihood that it was the financiers, and 5% likelihood that it has something to do with the Freemasons. That's my shake. Let me know. If you're watching on YouTube, let me know what you think in the comments below. Let's talk about it, guys. And one would be excused for holding this notion. The conspiracy theories revolving around the Pope's death gravitate around the IOR Calvi Sindona banking scandals or the secret Masonic lodges with frequent overlaps. And all the major characters involved have been assassinated. Allegedly. Do you remember Roberto Calvi, the director of Banco Ambrosiano? He was found dead, hanging from the Blackfriars Bridge in London on June the 17th, 1982. His death was initially ruled as a suicide, but in 2005, the case was reopened as a murder trial. Oh my god, that's sometime later. Why? 
The roster of suspects included several members of the Sicilian Mafia, as well as a character worthy of his own episode, one Licio Gelli, head of the subversive P2 Masonic Lodge. All were acquitted, but the Italian magistrature acknowledged that Calvi's death was not a suicide. Wait, this was in London. Why is the Italian magistrature looking at it? What is the Italian magistrature? I assume that's just like Italian courts? Like with magistrates and shit? And then there is Michelle Sindona, the other banker. On July the 11th, 1979, Giorgio Ambrosoli, a lawyer investigating Sindona's deals, was gunned down by the mafia. On March the 18th, 1986, Sindona was convicted for instigating this murder. Two days later, he died from cyanide poisoning while in prison. That's pretty f***ing suspicious. <laughs> As per Mino Pecarelli, the investigative journalist, we have already discussed his unsolved shooting. However, all these deaths were unequivocally violent. The identity of the culprits may still be a mystery, but the fact that these people were killed is not up for discussion. In the case of the smiling Pope, his death was apparently and mercifully peaceful. There may have been some initial ambiguity on whether the causes were natural or not, but the proponents of the poisoning have never been able to materialize convincing evidence. Despite my initial propensity to err on the conspiracy side, I can confidently say that Pope Albino Luciano died of natural causes. As sad and unfair as it sounds, a man who had shown great promise to, to modernize a stale institution died 33 years into his mandate. He definitely had a sharp brain, a vast intellect, and a big heart. Unfortunately, the same part proved too weak to cope with the pressures of his job. Yeah, Arnaldo and I exactly the same page. And thanks for being here. If you enjoyed this episode, please do leave us a review wherever you get your podcast. Also, if you're watching on YouTube, like I say, leave a comment below, subscribe, like the video, and I'll see you next time.